Here is the same measure of trust, trust amongst the American states. It's a very similar scatter. It goes over a very similar range. It doesn't fall quite as low, but it goes up to 60 or 65 percent. Um, you know, this isn't just a fluke to do with one set of countries. Um, so, let's look at some of the other things. This is mental illness. This isn't people coming into their GP and saying they're depressed or can't sleep or something, uh, which may vary depending on, you know, access to health care and so on. This is the World Health Organization giving the same diagnostic interviews to random samples of the population in each country. So we can compare levels of mental illness in each country. And up the side, you've got the proportion of the population who had any mental illness in the preceding year. Most of it, probably things like anxiety and depression and, and so on. But look at the scale of the differences. At the bottom here, more equal countries, you've got maybe 8% of the population had some mental illness in the preceding year. Look at the more unequal countries, the rates are three times as high. Three times the population <coughs> prevalence of mental illness. And it's just um, mind-boggling in a way. Uh, this is infant mortality. Um, quite big differences, I suppose about twofold, but actually that, that regression line, the line of best fit, you can see it should be steeper. Anyway, uh, let's move on. This is data from the UN Office on Drugs and Crime. They have separate survey data for use of opiates, cocaine, cam cannabis, ecstasy and amphetamines. We put them all together in one index and uh, again, a highly significant relationship with inequality. Uh, where have we got to here? Teenage birth rates. These are teenage births per thousand women in their teens. The scale of differences is very marked again. Uh, goes from about five births per thousand teenage women. In Canada you have four times that rate. In Britain we have six times that rate. And in uh, USA they have over ten times that rate. Uh, absolutely vast. I once li worked in health promotion for a few years in the health service in, in Bristol. We would have been so thrilled if we could have made a 10% or 20% re reduction in any problem. And we're talking about all these huge differences. This one is violence. Um, these dots are American states and the little triangles are Canadian provinces. Um, you're, as you'll be glad to know, more equal than the United States and lower mortality, so you come at the bottom left. But look once more at the scale of the differences. You've got 15 homicides per million. Well, some, some of your provinces are, are substantially below that, but 15 would be middle between 0 and 30. And it goes up to 150. Tenfold differences in homicide. The differences in our book, and what we do is not pick out the, the most dramatic uh, examples from the literature and, and show them. What we've done instead is to show for the same group of countries with the same measure of inequality, uh, every single um, health and social problem panning out like this. Uh, this is prisoners. <coughs> Proportion of the people locked up in different countries. Prisoners per 100,000 population. This is on a log scale, which means the difference between 1 and 10 is the same as from 10 to 100 and, and so on. So it compresses the top. Otherwise, this would go curving up probably off the top. Um, uh, but the scale of the differences again. It's harder with a log scale to judge where 40 might be, but Japan is around 40 per 100,000. And it goes up to 400, well, above in the USA. So that's tenfold differences in the scale of uh, imprisonment, the proportion of the people locked up in each country. And actually that relationship is not driven mainly by more crime. It's mainly a matter of more punitive sentencing. Uh, we found when we were writing that there were th over 300 people in prison for life for shoplifting in California on the three strikes and you're out principle. And it, it really, it's pretty barbaric. And actually, the prison regimes differ. I often say if you've got to go to prison somewhere, go in one of the more equal countries, you'll get some remedial help, whereas 
if you go in some of the more unequal ones, you'll come out brutalised. You'll get a lot of solitary confinement and uh, so on. Uh, what have we got next? Oh, yes, social mobility. This is an important one, although there are rather few points. When we first published it, we actually had even fewer data points. Um, but what it's suggesting is that in the more unequal countries, social mobility is lower. The measure they use is income mobility, so they're, I'm afraid it's all very male. It's comparing father's incomes with son's incomes. Um, and, uh, and looking at father's income when the son is born and the son's income 30 years later. And they're asking, do rich fathers have rich sons and poor fathers have poor sons? And of course, if father's income is highly predictive of son's incomes, then you've got low social mobility. Um, <clears throat> and uh, you've got low social mobility in the UK and U USA. You've got high social mobility in Denmark and Finland. Uh, and again, this is Kate's joke. I, I'm, I'm not very good at jokes, but she says, if Americans want to live the American dream, they should go to Denmark and Finland. <laughs> <laughs> but um, e even when we had fewer data points, we felt fairly confident that this, uh, the correlation meant something because we knew that while income differences widened in, in Britain and the United States, that social mobility had slowed and residential segregation had increased. And I'm told that in Canada, while your income differences have uh, uh, widened, your social mobility has slowed. Um, and of course, um, I think it makes good sense if you think what's happening. I mean, as the material differences increase, the social distances increase, the feelings of superiority and inferiority to do with social status. Um, and so I think that, you know, in more unequal countries, there's more downward prejudice to struggle against, um, uh, you know, whether it's uh, class prejudice or prejudice against ethnic minorities or I think actually prejudice against women too is part of this probably. But uh, the great justification that's always trundled out for big inequalities of outcome is that it's all very fair if uh, you know we can get equality of opportunity and the thing we should concentrate is not reducing inequality of outcome but to try and make sure everyone has a fair chance in life what this suggests is that it's I mean, no country ever gets anywhere near equal opportunities but it suggests it's very much harder if you're in a more unequal society to get anywhere near that. Um, this is rather surprising, I think. I, I thought it was a really major flaw in my whole argument and I didn't know how to deal with the evidence that it really looked as if um, health, uh, as if um, everyone benefits. Um, but I think it's now easier to understand why and uh, the data is quite clear. Uh, I may say just the size of the differences I've been showing you, you know, eight, ten, well, well sometimes only threefold differences in outcomes. You can't explain such big differences just in terms of inequality affecting a, the poor, a poor minority or an ethnic minority or something like that. Uh, these differences are so big because most of us are affected. And uh, but fortunately, we don't just have to infer from that kind of consideration. Uh, there are a number of studies where uh, you can look at, you can see how people at different points in the social hierarchy do in more and less equal societies. This is one of the, one of the very old data. Um, <clears throat> it's when people are trying to compare health inequalities between nations. And some Swedish... Uh, um, uh, researchers classified a number of their infant deaths according to our British Registrar General's occupational class classification. And uh, it starts from class one at the top here, professional occupations, uh, directors of larger companies, down through to junior non-manual, skilled manual, semi-skilled, and the unskilled manual. And then again, because anachronistically it's a classification by father's occupation, Single parents go alone. Um, but you see that Sweden does better than us all the way across the scale. Um, even at the top, they do better. And there was another paper showing uh, 
uh, adult mortality with the same pattern. In our book we show five or six examples of this, uh, sometimes comparing Britain and the States, sometimes comparing different American states, sometimes looking at uh, maths and literacy scores, sometimes looking at health. Uh, and the general picture, if one's going to generalize about who benefits from greater equality, uh, I think the closest you can come to an accurate generalization is that uh, it uh, benefits everyone, but benefits the poor most of all. But it's not just actually these fairly simple ways of looking at it that reach these conclusions. People at the Harvard School of Public Health who've done multi-level models and look to see uh, who benefit have referred to inequality as a general social pollutant because its effects seem to go so far up the income scale. Let me just show you one more example. This is a very old graph, and it actually it's produced by Doug Wilms uh, here in Canada. And it, instead, it's, it's literacy scores, but instead of classifying kids by uh, social class, as in that last graph, it's they're classified by years of education of the parents. And so up there on the top right, you've got the kids of well-educated parents nearer the top of society. And even there, it looks as if it's a bit better to be in Sweden than Canada, and worst of all, to be in the USA. But at the bottom, there are just enormous differences. And the effect of putting all these problems together is it, it emphasizes what they have in common in terms of causes. And so what it's telling us, in a way, is that inequality is a common cause of all these different things. And so what we're looking at is a general social dysfunction related to inequality. Um, I may say also another point important to make at this stage is that you see Sweden and Japan do pretty well. But in terms of cultural differences, you can, there are not two more different culture, countries in, uh, amongst the OEC lot um, than those two. I mean, think of the position of women in, in Sweden and Japan. Uh, or how closely they keep to the nuclear family. They're totally different. But also how they get their greater equality is totally different. Uh, Sweden has large differences in earnings, and they redistribute with high taxes and benefits, big welfare state. Japan starts off with smaller differences in earnings and has lower taxes and a uh, smaller welfare state. And we find just the same difference amongst some of the American states. In Vermont and New Hampshire both do pretty well. Um, but uh, uh, Vermont has one of the higher social expenditures amongst American states and higher social, social and higher taxation. Um, and New Hampshire has the lowest state taxation of any state except Alaska. And lower social expenditure as well. But they do well because their initial earnings differences are small. I don't know why that is, but one of the things I've recently found is that they, one of the things they do do is protect trade union rights. So uh, it is illegal to try and get an employee to sign a contract banning trade union membership. It's also illegal to organize strike breaking. Uh, and I have found a number, a couple of papers which uh, suggest that, um, and on, on statistical evidence, that trade union movements are more uh, are stronger in more equal societies. So maybe they have a role to play in this. Um, 